name is Sarah Alger. I'm the director of the Russell Museum. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Uh, so those of you who have been here a number of times are going to get sick of my asking, but who has not been to the museum before? Okay. Okay, great. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. So, um, so thanks to, to the many repeat visitors we have. Um, so if you, clearly if you have been here before, you enjoy our programming, and if you, um, you are new and you decide that you like it, um, we are looking for um, support for the lecture series. Um, so if you're interested to give, we do have some envelopes down um, by our friendly security officers at the front desk. Uh, a couple of quick uh, other museum notes before I introduce our speaker. So our next speaker is Dr. James O'Connell. He's going to be here on June 28th um, talking about his work with Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program. And he'll be doing a book signing as well. He recently published a book about his 30 plus years um, caring for the homeless population here. Uh, and then, as many of you know, we take sort of a summer break from lectures. Um, and then, um, in September, the last week of September, we're going to dive into Hub Week again. We are participating in Hub Week again this year. Um, programming is still in progress, but I can tell you some of it's going to be um, related to research, and some of it is going to be about the intersection of arts and medicine. Um, and there will be some evening programming and some day programming, so stay tuned for that. Um, if you're not already on our mailing list, I'm going to send around a clipboard um, so you can sign up and keep up with everything that's going on here. So to introduce our speaker, um, Dr. David Fisher is both an MD and a PhD. He's Chief of Dermatology here at Mass General, and he's the Wigglesworth Professor of Dermatology at Harvard Medical School. He directs the melanoma program here. Uh, at the Cancer Center and the Cutaneous Bi Biology Research Center. He trained in internal medicine as well as pediatric and adult oncology. And after 15 years on the faculty in pediatric oncology at Dana-Farber and Boston Children's Hospital, he came to Mass General to chair the dermatology department in 2008. He runs an active research lab which has made numerous fundamental contributions to the fields of skin biology, pigmentation, and melanoma. So with that, let's welcome Dr. Fisher. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, celebrating our one day of spring with a sunny <laughs> sky by talking about the perils of the sun. I'm sorry to be doing that. Um, but um, as you'll see, um, there are both attractions and dangers. When, when we think about the sun, uh, there's a huge amount of pathology. Um, that is related not only to the injury that is inflicted by the sun on our skin, but also even to behavioral consequences that I'm going to touch on that we believe are triggered by sunlight and some of the interactions that it makes when sunlight hits our skin. Um, so um, to emphasize some of the dangers, um, we know that one of the risks of, uh, of ultraviolet radiation, of, of sun exposure, is heat. Um, and you can cook things, and, and that's obviously exemplified in this little question. So here are the topics I'd like to cover. Um, and I'm going to do my very best to stay off of the highly technical aspects of these, <clears throat> but try to deal with them at the level where they impact um, a common knowledge, a common understanding of how we interface with our environment um, and try also to understand where um, an educated perspective on some of the attractions as well as risks of the sun um, can impact our behaviors to minimize the risk of, of the injurious effects of, of sunlight. So I'll talk about what we mean by ultraviolet radiation and the electromagnetic spectrum that is emanating from sunlight. Vitamin D, very important potential target of sun exposure. What's going on with vitamin D? Cancer, huge area. Skin cancer in particular, <clears throat> we are living at this moment in the midst of a revolution in the therapy of melanoma. Melanomas 
at advanced stages are being cured. I don't know if you saw the story on Jimmy Carter, who had melanoma metastatic to his brain and many parts of his body. Um, as far as we know, I didn't treat him, but my understanding is that he is completely free of disease at this point. Um, and this was not a fluke therapy. This is actually standard therapy as of right now, as of the last year or two. Um, and we are living in a, in a revolution that is unbelievably exciting, not only for melanoma, but actually for the entire world of cancer, led by melanoma, and I'll touch on that and why we think that is happening, and what is it, what's the clue, what are some of the clues from melanoma that might inform that. Tanning, sun tanning, addiction, the behavioral propensity to be in the sun, and from that I will move into this issue of mind-body, um, which is a little soft for what most academic professors talk about, but in fact, there is something we think very fundamental that is going on here that, that resides in the midst of, uh, of our understanding of, of key pieces of human biology. So here is a depiction of the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation that is emanating, that is being emitted in sunlight. So what you, there are basically two key variables in the way this radiation is emitted. There is the wavelength and there is the energy. The wavelength is sort of left to right. These are long waves, these are short waves. And the amplitude, or the energy, is the, the vertical span of these. You can have very weak energy, and you can have ginormous energy that can do uh, actually an enormous amount of damage. Um, but all of these are impacted in a, in a dual fashion. So the wavelength has distinctive effects, and the energy has distinctive effects. So some of these are famous, okay, so these long wavelengths, things like radio waves, microwaves, infrared, producing heat. This is the span where we can see, we can see those, that region of the spectrum, relatively narrow region of the spectrum. The rest we can't visualize with our retinas, with our eyes. Down just smaller than the violet part is what we call ultraviolet radiation. We'll be talking quite a bit about ultraviolet radiation. Smaller than that X-rays, smaller than that gamma rays. These are used diagnostically. These are used for terrible things like bombs. Um, and some of these are also used, as you know, therapeutically as well in settings where you might want to actually kill cells. If we take the same spectrum and we even break it apart further, we can subdivide the ultraviolet region of the spectrum into what people have described as UVA, B, and C. And you'll see in a moment why we think that's important, because they actually have different biological activities that are related to the fact that their wavelengths are different. So the, the spectrum is defined, as you can see, purely by the size of those waves, from long waves down to short. Energy is a completely separate matter, and it can actually be tuned in a different way. And actually, the proportion of these different wavelengths that are emitted by the sun um, the proportions of these that are filtered out by a cloudy day, by our atmosphere, by the distance from the sun, and so on, is, is highly variable. So while I show this as a continuous spectrum, actually, um, it's not perfectly reflected equivalently across the spectrum, and I don't even know all the details of exactly what's here and what's there, but you've heard, for example, the ozone layer play a role in shielding some of the UVB, um, but there are certainly effects of, uh, across that region. But I wanted you to get a sense that we're looking at ultraviolet radiation here, visible like a very short region of the spectrum. Here's another way to look at it. Um, I just show it because it's kind of expanding out the UV region, the visible light region, and it's here in the UV, particularly UVA, UVB, and UVC, where we are most at risk in terms of the deleterious effects that I'll be discussing today. So what does ultraviolet radiation do? What are the consequences? <clears throat> so because of the distinctive wavelengths, the length of the recurring wave of electromagnetic radiation that is represented in the ultraviolet range of the spectrum, there is a capacity of the energy present within those waves to actually be absorbed into certain molecules within our bodies, actually molecules within our cells. And those molecules have certain molecular features that will have a capacity to resonate with the wavelengths. Bigger wavelengths, smaller wavelengths will have a much, they'll bounce off, they may pass through, they may miss it altogether, um, but these wavelengths have the capacity to actually interact and 
and actually resonate, meaning lead to an, an, a, a transmission of an energy to the molecular structure of those chemical entities. And those entities that are in our cells that can be affected by UV are proteins, DNA, and RNA. And these are very, very important constituents of our cells. And that is the reason that this region of the electromagnetic spectrum has such an impact on our cells. It's even been used as a tool. UV radiation has been used as a tool in the laboratory <clears throat> to get molecules to cross-link with each other because that's what can happen. If you wanted to study how proteins bind to our genomic DNA, people would UV cross-link and then pull out which are the proteins that were sticking to the DNA and on that basis deduce which proteins out of all the proteins in our genome actually are sitting on DNA and which ones are far away from DNA, which ones are in the nucleus and so on. So UV has even been a tool to get these molecules to absorb energy and start reacting in a different way. Separately from this ability to chemically cross-link by making bonds between molecules, UV can cause another type of an injury in which it causes the target molecules to emit a class of species which we call reactive oxygen. And this is something you've probably heard a lot about, antioxidants. This is what the antioxidants are fighting against. It's the pro-oxidant damage that is triggered. And particularly the UVA region of that spectrum is producing reactive oxygen species. And this is a pro-oxidant state within the cell that has the capacity to produce a lot of injury. It's a different type of a chemical injury, but this is something that happens when we're going out in the sun, even casually. And our bodies, again, are experiencing the damage and, in many cases, repairing the damage, as we'll talk about in just a second. So what are some of the consequences of these effects when our skin is subjected to UV radiation? Well, the famous one, sunburn. Sort of like that cartoon, except that was more like popcorn. Um, death of cells. If your DNA is mutated or injured, if your proteins are cross-linked in a fashion that prevents them from functioning normally, the cell can't survive in some instances, and it will die. Sometimes the death of those cells is a good outcome, because alternatively, one option is that the impact in our DNA, in our genome, might be to alter the sequence of the nucleotide without killing. And when that happens, our cell has acquired a mutation, and that mutation, at a low frequency but not a zero frequency, might cause the cell to behave abnormally. And if that abnormal behavior is causing uncontrolled growth, we call it cancer. The most common organ in humans to be afflicted by cancer is the skin, by far, by far. Uh, we'll see some of the numbers in just a moment, especially when you're talking about fair-skinned people living in sunny places, first day of spring or summer. Um, unfortunately, we deal with a huge, huge risk associated with UV and mutations in the skin, giving rise to skin cancer. So in that setting, the ability to die is actually advantageous. We would rather have a cell die and ideally be replaced by a healthy cell rather than have the cell hang out, survive, and even have uncontrolled growth. Immune suppression. UV radiation turns out to have selective toxicity for certain cell types in our body, and cells of the immune system tend to be hypersensitive. So to some degree, our skin can be treated by ultraviolet radiation as a way to get rid of inflammatory conditions. And this is actually, we have a, what we call phototherapy, which is ultraviolet radiation that is occasionally used to treat inflammatory conditions in the field of dermatology. We don't recommend using the sun for this. We recommend many other therapies first, um, but in fact, immune suppression can occur from this as well. And then, of course, in the chronic setting, we see injury. Many of the manifestations of aging that most people will associate with how you would tell in a split second how old is this person has to do with UV damage to the skin and the chronic accumulation of those issues. Skin thickening, pigmentation changes, wrinkling, these are all essentially the long-term consequences of injury to the skin from ultraviolet radiation. So how do the cells respond? As I mentioned, they can die. And interestingly, the cells of our skin, many of the cells of our skin, but not all, 
have actually evolved a mechanism not just to die from the chaos of proteins that aren't working well, but actually they have evolved to recognize when certain injuries have occurred that they will commit suicide. There is actually a program that utilizes energy to commit suicide. This is sort of one of the few examples of altruism in biology, presumably for the sake of the whole organism. You would be better off not developing skin cancer if that injury is recognized as something for which the organism will benefit if the cell will commit suicide. And, and we can clearly see this pathway, which has been called apoptosis, um, as a, a very, very constant event. If you're going out in the sun casually, walking to your car, the odds are there are going to be a few cells in your skin that have received enough UV damage that they will be committing suicide on a natural basis. There is also a cleanup program. Um, the more popular name for this would be a sunburn. When you have a lot of injury, um, the sunburn is in fact an inflammatory response as a lot of cells are dying from too much UV damage. There is a, a swelling, blood flow is increased, bring in a lot of inflammatory cells, clean up the damage, and it is that, that redness associated with more blood that is flowing in that area. Um, and the swelling from the fluid from the blood that is in there trying to clean up, that is essentially an inflammatory response. And then there's the tanning response. The tanning response, as you'll see in a moment, <coughs> describe what it is, is essentially an injury response. Tanning is not a piece of evolution designed to make people look good for the prom. We don't think. Um, we think it is actually an injury response that has a survival advantage associated with if you go out again tomorrow, having slightly darker skin may give you a little bit of UV protection. It's in a sense the way the skin is fighting the UV radiation. It's kind of ironic that people would seek a tan because the tan is seeking not to be irradiated by UV, it's seeking to protect. So there is a kind of an interesting paradox in that. So here is what DNA looks like, the double helix with the base pair bonding between the two strands of the double helix. And here is a sort of depiction of what you might see after UV radiation injures some of the nucleotides. And what typically happens is the nucleotides that are supposed to see a partner across the strands like that become cross-linked to each other on the adjacent strand, thereby interfering with the cross strand, and these eventually get resolved to alter the, the chemical nature of the species that are in, in, the, uh, in the skin. And this can give rise to mutations, changes in proteins, and so on. So you remember this depiction of the spectrum. This is the ultraviolet region of the spectrum, broken down into UVA, UVB, UVC. What I'm showing here is that it is the UVB subsection of the ultraviolet spectrum which is responsible for three very important things. Vitamin D synthesis, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. Sunburning, and this is actually very important. If you're in UVA region, sunburning is much, much less likely to occur. Tanning, it happens, will occur with UVB or with UVA. But it turns out that many of our sunscreens, the historically most active sunscreens, were measured and quantified by the SPF value that many of you are familiar with. That is a measure of protection against burning. And burning is a measure of protection against UVB, not UVA. But UVA can cause tanning, and it can also cause cancer. So you could imagine that if you had a great sunscreen that beautifully protects you from burning, and does nothing to protect against UVA, you may not only fail to protect against the carcinogenic, the cancer effects of UVA, you might actually increase your risk because you've lost the alarm. <coughs> that feeling that I'm burning, I better get out of the sun, no longer there, you're not burning. But you're getting UVA, you're getting UVA, and all the silent mutations in your skin. And so some of the early studies that looked at cancer incidents in people who use sunscreens from 90s and 10 years ago actually showed elevated incidence of skin cancers, particularly melanoma, in people who were using the older versions of sunscreens that didn't have the broad spectrum protection against UVA as well. Now, for fear that I would lose my job, 
as chairman of dermatology at MGH, let me make something really clear. You should use sunscreen. <laughs> I'm not recommending that you should do that. Um, however, there is reason to understand that there is something better than using sunscreen to protect against ultraviolet radiation, which is not to be exposed to it in the first place. Um, because even the existing broad spectrum products that are out there, the UVA protection is controversial right now. FDA is in limbo, they want broad spectrum ingredients to be used, but they're actually refusing to approve them. They're not happy with the safety studies that have been carried out for that region of the spectrum. Europe has more of these compounds in use. FDA is not satisfied with the data. So we're kind of in this funny limbo place. Um, broad spectrum, that of, of the commercially available products that are there, broad spectrum is better and it is advisable. Clothing is even better. Shade is even better yet. And that terrible word abstinence is probably the best of all. So um, I, would, I would keep this in mind um, even for, for skin cancer and UV protection. So sunshine in a bottle it has been one of the ways that vitamin D has been advertised. Um, where do we get this term and what is vitamin D and, and, and what is its relationship to the skin? So vitamin D is a vitamin that our body is unable to fully synthesize. Um, we don't typically get it very well from diet um, unless you have a very, very rich seafood diet for things like cod liver oil. Um, um, it turns out that there is one step in the synthesis of vitamin D, but here are some compounds. There'll be a quiz at the end. I hope you memorize all these structures. Um, I'm joking about that. So here is cholesterol. This is the complicated way of looking at it. This is the simple way of looking at it right here. Um, but cholesterol is chemically a precursor of vitamin D. This is vitamin D right here. And what happens is if you, you see the various bonds, so there are four multi-carbon cyclic bonds right here, A, B, C, and D. And you'll notice that between, I can't even see what the numbers is, is it? Eight. It's Eight. between, in the B ring, the bond at this position here and that position here is a bond that needs to break. Here is that position, and here it has been broken. That chemical energy to break this bond we have no enzymatic machinery. In fact, I'm not aware of any animal in the entire universe, certainly this planet, that has an enzymatic machinery capable of breaking that bond. And that bond is vital because at the end of the day, when that bond is broken, this A ring is free to swing around and this rest of this becomes a linear portion. So this is what it looks like. It has just swung around so that the A ring is now separated from C and D. B has been broken because of that bond. That energy beautifully matches the resonance of UVB wavelengths. UVB inserts there, and with the appropriate energy, poof, breaks it open. And this is not just some little accidental, trivial thing. This is vital. Without vitamin D, we all will die in childhood. This was a vital piece of evolution, and I'll talk about what we need vitamin D for in just a moment, but at the end of the day, we cannot fully synthesize there. We can make the precursors, and we can go on from here and use it, but there is one step that is a light energy dependent step in the synthesis of, of vitamin D. And by the way, the reason cod liver oil has a lot of vitamin D is that even the fish have trouble with this. So what happens is they absorb algae that were sitting near the top of the ocean. So these are bottom feeders, right? And so vitamin D is what we call one of the fat-soluble vitamins. So they, and many animals as well, that have trouble you know, getting out in the sun very much because predators eat them up, they have a very fatty liver. So the fattiness of the liver stores vitamin D. And so they have very, very high levels of vitamin D in the liver that can sustain them for a long time without sun exposure. So bottom feeders at the bottom of the ocean, fish that, that live down there, um, nocturnal animals, mice and rats, and so, you know, they hold on to vitamin D in their liver for a very, very long time. And it turns out that there is a, a population of Indians living in Arctic area, the Inuits, who uh, this was kind of noticed because they have dark skin, which you would think wouldn't fit with being in a high latitude. There's not much UV up there. 
but it turns out they have such a rich seafood diet that they are one of the few populations that get enough vitamin D from diet. Whereas for most of us, we don't eat foods that have sufficient vitamin D in our diet. So, and that's the bond right there, just to show you. Okay. So what do we need vitamin D for? Vitamin D is essential for calcium absorption by our GI tract. Our <coughs> intestines require vitamin D for us to absorb calcium in our food, and that is required for us to make bones. And so severe vitamin D deficiency is associated with skeletal abnormalities. Uh, in an adult, it can be very significant for osteoporosis risk and fractures, and in childhood, where one is actually growing and laying down bone mass at a very high rate, um, this is actually a, a very, very serious, rickets is the name of the condition of vitamin D deficiency. So a very, very serious problem. We really do need vitamin D for this. There is speculated involvement of vitamin D in many other pathways in the body, cardiovascular, infectious disease, cancer, other areas, most of which I would say are not proven. There's a little bit of a fad problem, I would say, in the vitamin D world, uh, where people say, you know, it's sunshine in a bottle, it'll be good for your the immune system and so on. And maybe there's some truth to it, but really carefully controlled studies by and large are lacking for many of these other areas. I wouldn't say they're wrong, um, but I would say it's not necessarily proven. But the, the necessity of this for bone health is unequivocal. There's no question about that. During evolution, as I mentioned, light was the primary source for vitamin D synthesis because very rare sources that were rich enough in the diet would be capable of sustaining the needed levels of vitamin D. Importantly, today, we do not recommend, I do not recommend use of sunlight as a way of maintaining a healthy vitamin D level. Why? We know it works. We know it's capable of doing it. So we can go to CVS and for pennies buy 2,000 unit tablets of vitamin D, tons of it, you know, more, probably more than anybody even needs. It's cheap, it's plentiful, and it's the same vitamin D that you would make in your skin. So there's one way to get it for pennies. Fortunately, it's inexpensive and plentiful. And there's another way to get it, absolutely for free, with cancer. <laughs> so um, the linkage between ultraviolet radiation and skin cancer is absolutely unequivocal. I'll be talking quite a bit about that in the coming minutes. So there is absolutely no doubt that the arguments which have been made, and there have unfortunately been quite a few, that the use of UV to generate elevated levels of vitamin D, which is good for you, is faulty. The concept that vitamin D is good for you is not faulty. That's absolutely clear. But use of ultraviolet radiation is one of the worst possible ways of going about it. And I'll tell you another reason that I would say as a physician why it's a bad way to do it. And that's because it's unpredictable. If you had a very high cholesterol level, and you went to your primary care doctor and they said, you should take Lipitor, or you should take something to get this into a healthy. And you know what? If you go out in the sun for you know a little bit, it might also do it. Would you say, OK, I'll go out in the sun a little bit. You know, If it's a rainy day, oh well, too bad, and I have heart disease. You know, It's just not predictable. So UV absorption in the skin and the ability to predict exactly what that will do for your vitamin D levels is unpredictable on the following grounds. Where do you live? Okay, in Boston, our UV is actually relatively not intense because we're high latitude. Florida, much more intense. What time of year? Winter, there's very little UV here. Summer, pretty intense up here. Um, what time of day? Seven in the morning, not very much. Noon, pretty strong. How much of your skin is exposed? Are you wearing a shirt? Are you wearing clothing? Are you wearing a hat? Totally different. You may have a hundred times more skin exposed. And how much pigment do you have in your skin? So these variables make it a totally moving target and unpredictable. You wouldn't treat something that is medically important if you need to replace levels. You wouldn't take wild guesses like that. It's, it's actually, actually, I would argue that's a, even a more compelling argument than the cancer argument because it's not predictable. Vitamin D is actually too important and one should maintain a healthy level. It's very easy to have it checked with your blood work, with your cholesterol, they can throw in a vitamin D level. And actually many people in Boston, because of the, the weak UV index up here, actually are relatively vitamin D. I take vitamin D replacement every day 
which I learned about just from a routine blood test. Um, so it's, it's a wise thing to do, and I suspect a lot of osteoporosis that we see in elderly people is related to earlier in life not having looked at that carefully. Um, okay, and as I mentioned, um, or actually I haven't mentioned this yet, there is a striking correlation in skin pigmentation <coughs> through human evolution with geographic location that matches UV intensity. So it really has to do with distance from the equator. As you know, the equator roughly in the middle of the Earth, that's the highest UV because it's the closest to the sun. It's still pretty far from the sun, but it's closer than the poles. And therefore, as you move to higher and higher latitude, <coughs> high latitude can be the South Pole or the North Pole, the UV intensity is diminished significantly. And human populations that migrated to high latitude locations became lighter and lighter. And that's where you see light-skinned individuals, you see Mediterranean complexion, and then you see darkly pigmented individuals who geographically, through evolution 100,000 years ago, correlated quite clearly. And it's easy to see why that would happen. Um, and, and that has been the correlation that allowed people to make the assumption that UV, the need for UV, having light skin, would increase the ability of UV to produce vitamin D, um, and correspondingly having darker pigment that might protect the skin from the intensity of, of UV and other wavelengths of light um, would pro provide that balance and, that, and explain that gradient. So what does our skin look like? Um, here is a, a cross-section. Um, I won't quiz you on all of the different layers or the organelles. Here's a hair. That's easy to see. The epidermis is everything above this wavy line, so it's right up here. The very top layer is dead, dead cells. Um, and then up here is the epidermis. And these little brown circles are melanocytes. Those are the pigment cells that make pigment. And here is what it looks like if we actually take a cross-section of human skin, and it has been stained to see these different populations. Um, and this is that epidermis layer. The top layer here is the dead layer, what we call the stratum corneum. This is very, very, very important because this is a barrier. This, this allows you to jump into a dirty pond or put your hand in the mud or spill toxic whatever on your hand and you leave on it, just wash them and it all goes away. Um, this is a phenomenal, phenomenal barrier and it's something that we terrestrial organisms evolved to be able to deal with the environment in, in many different ways. The, evol the, the epidermis, this multicellular layer up here, is mostly keratinocytes <clears throat> and these are epithelial cells, they slough off, they actually become the dead layer at the very top. And at the deepest portion of this epidermal layer are individual cells shown here with these arrows that are the melanocytes. Here is a view where the melanocytes have actually been stained, and you can pick out the individual cells. So one thing that's very immediately obvious is that even though pigment in our skin is really obvious, so somebody with dark pigment, somebody with light pigment in skin is incredibly obvious, the melanocytes that make the pigment are not very abundant. And the reason for this is that while they make the pigment, they then export the pigment, and the pigment is taken up by these overlying keratinocytes. So most of the pigment in our skin is in keratinocytes, but it was synthesized by the melanocytes sitting down there at the base. And I should point out, the melanocytes are the cell of origin of melanoma. <coughs> keratinocytes are the cell of origin of the other common skin cancers, squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma, which are even more common than melanoma. So let's talk about skin cancer for a minute. As I mentioned, skin is the commonest site of human cancer, and in principle, it ought to be among the most preventable forms. Why? How many cancers can we point to and say, we know a cause? So cigarettes, yes, there's a causal relationship. That's about it. There are a few others. There's epidemiology, there's statistics, but UV, Ultraviolet radiation and skin cancer is solid, and it is the most common site, and it is shocking, you would think, in 2016 that that relationship would still hold. In fact, it is so striking, it made us and other researchers wonder if there's something else going on. Because people are intelligent, nobody wants to be getting cancer. The relationship of ultraviolet radiation and skin cancer is not news. This has been known for decades. And very intelligent people, you know, people who have good behavior patterns, 
you know, know better and are actually nonetheless finding themselves getting this. And so I'll come back to this in just a few moments. It suggested maybe there is something going on that either complicates or overlies the relationship between ultraviolet radiation and skin cancer. So I mentioned the incidence is actually rising still. Melanoma, non-melanoma skin cancer, it is still rising despite we have sunscreens, we have education. Um, and one of the reasons we think part of that rise is happening is while I mentioned that human pigmentation historically matched UV geographies, now we live in a jumbled jet world of people who are darkly pigmented and lightly pigmented live everywhere. And lightly pigmented people living in Australia, living in Israel, Arizona, Florida, um, are at, at very high risk, actually, even Boston, unfortunately. And so that discrepancy between UV um, and, and skin pigmentation is a problem. In fact, we know now, even in high latitude locations, like Boston, like Scandinavia, fair skinned people also have elevated incidence of most of the common skin cancers. Is it increasing in incidence? Take a look at seven per 100,000 for melanoma. 1975, threefold, 300% increase in incidence. This is about 10 years ago. So we are looking at, during this time, the most dramatic increase in the incidence of any cancer in man was the increase in the incidence of melanoma. And again, it was new, certainly later on in this, it was totally known that UV was associated with this, that sunlight causes UV, that there are sunscreens, that there is shade, perfectly well-intentioned people. This has been a clue, which I'll try to address in a moment, that something else may be happening. Here's another way of looking at the incidence. 1935 melanoma incidence, one out of 1,500. Progressive increase, one out of 50 in 2010, and still rising. For non-melanoma skin cancers, one in five. So very, the good news about non-melanoma skin cancers is that most of them are very curable just by removing them. So this is not, these are non-melanoma, they are not as invasive, not as likely to spread, metastasize, or be lethal, which is very important. A few gory pictures, but fortunately very curable if caught early enough. Um, superficial spreading, subtype of melanoma, and this is what we would call a nodular type of melanoma. This round area has a propensity to grow deep, so you won't necessarily, so not all melanomas look the same. That's a vital detail. And we have our own little A, B, C, D, E. A is asymmetry. When the two sides are not symmetric, that's a hint, something isn't right. If the borders are irregular, kind of goes along with asymmetry, that's a hint that something isn't right. Variation in color. The benign lesions of benign mold are more likely to have very homogeneous color, whatever the color is. But if there's a region that suddenly looks white or reddish or brownish with part of it being black, that's also a, a concerning feature. Diameter, typically people use the number six millimeters or smaller, that's the size of a pencil eraser. Um, bigger than that, something that should be looked at. And E for evolution, it's changing, something that's changing. Anything that's changing, that's obviously something that, that can be looked at. And, and So here is an atypical mole. It's not melanoma, but you can see it's got a bunch of these features. Um, probably the dermatologist would take it off. And fortunately, in many cases, it will be benign. Um, so, is it hard to tell? You bet it's hard to tell. And for that reason, we want to err on the side of getting it checked out. So change is key. How worried should you be? And this is a vital thing. A lot of people are so worried that they, they become frozen and maybe deny or are fearful of going to the doctor, fearful of the bad news. But actually, there's very good news. Six out of seven melanomas are cured just by cutting it out. Catching it early enough, six out of seven. It's the vast majority, actually, by finding it at a stage where it has not yet spread. And that's the total number of all comers who walk in and have them removed. Which means delaying is your enemy. That's the enemy. Having it looked at, having it removed, greatly increases your odds of being cured just by simply having it removed. Non-melanoma skin cancer, the most common cancers in America are these. 
basal cell carcinoma more than a million cases a year here, and squamous cell carcinoma about 200,000. Here is appearance of these. They have different appearances under the microscope, even to the naked eye. These are cancers of the keratinocytes, much, much less likely to invade deeply, much, much less likely to break off and spread and metastasize to other parts of the body. So usually local therapy in the skin is successful. In some instances, they too can spread. So they are things that a skin exam by a dermatologist or even any, any primary care doctor um, can help to identify. And again, removing it early can be curative in a very high fraction of cases, even a higher fraction than melanoma. Pigment in a lesion is not always melanoma. This is very important. So if you go back from this lecture tonight and take off your socks and like start to freak out, in fact, this is a pigmented basal cell carcinoma, which is one of the least worrisome of the skin cancers. It's a tumor. It should be removed. Very, very unlikely to cause you know, very serious problems later in life if it is removed. But it happens to stimulate production of pigment right there in the skin. So to the untrained eye, one might look at this and say, oh, oh it's got to be a melanoma. In fact, many of them, even if they're pigmented, are not melanomas. OK. The revolution in therapy. I want to take a few moments to talk about this. So there are two classes of therapy for melanoma that have transformed the disease as we think of it in the cancer center and, and in all cancer centers literally around the world. Melanoma used to be considered one of the absolute most dangerous cancers of all because we had almost nothing that had efficacy, nothing that could treat it when it reached an advanced stage. Melanoma has actually made it to the stage where we have heard in conferences when a tumor was biopsied and it wasn't clear what it is, where one of the pathologists said, well, maybe we'll be lucky and it will be a melanoma. And the reason is because the therapies have been so effective. Nowhere near as good as they need to be, but we are at a point where some of the therapies are producing long-term major responses. We hope we can use the word cure in between a third and half of patients with metastatic melanoma, which is unimaginable five or six years ago. Even. So huge, huge progress. There are two classes of therapy. One we call targeted therapy, and these are drugs that target specific proteins that have been mutated, and we've talked about mutations. So these are driver mutations that cause the cell to continuously grow, and these are drugs that are precision medicine getting right in there and disabling that very molecular engine that is driving the tumor. And there are pathway inhibitors that are part of this targeting approach. The second class of therapies we call immunotherapy. And this is where, and there are a variety of approaches to this, but this is where the immune system has been harnessed to attack the cancer and make the cancer go away. Here's an example of that BRAF gene that was studied in an animal model. This happens to be a fish model, believe it or not, that would allow one to study how an oncogene, like BRAF, could produce uncontrolled growth. And here you can see this fish actually has BRAF-induced moles. These are actually moles, nevi, on this fish. And in combination with loss of a second gene, so BRAF is mutated here, and in combination with loss of another important gene called P53, the fish would actually develop invasive melanomas. These are the kinds of laboratory systems that are used to study how these genes interact to regulate the formation of cancers. When patients with melanoma receive inhibitors against BRAF, and if their tumor has that mutation, each of these bars represents a patient and the size of their tumor. These patients here have seen their tumors completely shrink by 100%. And this one patient in the study saw the tumor continue to grow despite the, the drug treatment. The vast majority of the patients are responding to BRAF inhibition if their tumor is driven by the BRAF oncogene. The good news is that a very high fraction of patients with BRAF mutation respond to the drugs. The bad news is that the responses are not durable. And in a high fraction of cases, within about a year or so, the tumors will relapse. And there are a whole variety of mechanisms that allow the tumor to restore the pathway that BRAF was driving. And we are fortunately in a situation where that is being studied in great detail. And new tools are being made and new combinations added to these drugs 
to hopefully improve the durability of those responses. The second class I mentioned is immunotherapy. And this raises an interesting and important question. Actually, I don't like to use the word interesting because medicine is never really interesting. Patient care is not interesting, but it is very, very important. Science is interesting. So there is a science actually behind what we think is an explanation of why melanoma is immunogenic. Why would the immune system be somehow able to discriminate a cancer cell from our own cells? This is the age-old problem. Why chemo is so difficult and, and why it can be so toxic because normal cells are so similar to cancer. This is not like an infectious bacterium or fungus or virus. This is our own cells in cancer. So what is being discriminated? How can immunotherapy ever work? What, and why is melanoma the most immunogenic cancer? It appears as a, as a common cancer type that melanoma seems to be at the top of the list of cancers in terms of good responses to immunotherapy. And what we have found and what we believe is the explanation for this is quite remarkable. In the genome era, where it's been possible to sequence genomes of cancers, not only people, but even tumors from people, what was discovered is, not surprisingly, melanomas had very, very, very high incidence, thousands and thousands of mutations in their DNA from ultraviolet radiation. Of course, right? Because melanocytes have been baking under the sun during your entire life, and if one melanocyte suddenly took off and grew into a cancer cell, it has amplified that set of mutations, those thousands of mutations, and they are all present in the genome of that cell. Now, most of them are not affecting BRAF or any of the oncogenes, so they're not changing the growth of the cell. But it turns out that many of them alter one little amino acid that doesn't change the biology of the cell doesn't change how the cell grows or divides, but it can make that cell look ever so slightly foreign to our immune system. Because our immune systems are educated when we are babies to recognize all the normal proteins, every single normal protein that our body makes, our immune system is taught to become tolerant to and not to attack, not to have autoimmunity. But all of a sudden, you have a tumor with thousands of little amino acids that the immune system has never been educated against. And so, from the immune system's perspective, we believe these neoantigens might be tricking the tumor, the, the immune system, into thinking this is something foreign. And then, but of course, if it were that simple, we wouldn't have melanoma. The immune system would eradicate it, and it would be that simple. Unfortunately, then you get a battle, and usually, unfortunately, historically, the melanoma would eventually grow out. So there appears to be a battle, and it's a battle of tolerance, where the tumor is speaking to the, to the immune system and telling it, be tolerant. So much of what this cell is making is normal. You should be tolerant. And the immune system says, no, there's something there that looks like it's not supposed to be there, and you have a battle. And this is what it kind of looks like. You have a tumor cell and a T cell, a different tumor cell and a different T cell. T cells are of the immune system. And what we know is that these pathways of tolerance, shown here in brown and here in brown, if you block that, and this is one of the drugs that has been revolutionary for melanoma, you activate the T cell, and it becomes reactivated. So what was tolerant is now activated and capable of attacking the tumor. Similarly, for this pathway, these drugs, which are now FDA approved, when you block it, that T cell becomes activated. And the combination of these two agents, this is already a several-year-old study, 2013, each line represents one patient. This patient's tumor did not shrink. This patient grew a little bit and then started to shrink. All these patients had shrinkages, and all of these patients had 100% shrinkages, complete responses. This is about half of the patients on this study receiving these immune drugs, and these appear to be very, very durable. So this is hugely important and a breakthrough that's now already been approved for certain lung cancer patients and increasingly many other cancers as well. So I want to take the last few minutes and talk a little bit about tanning and behavior. I told you this mind-body thing that I would touch on. So this is a little mechanistic and I'll, I'll kind of go through it quickly and don't want to bore you with too many details. So how does our skin, so these are melanocytes and these are keratinocytes, how does our skin respond to ultraviolet radiation 
to make pigment? What is the molecular pathway of this? That's something we were very, very interested in. And surprisingly, it turned out that ultraviolet radiation doesn't stimulate pigment by directly attacking and injuring the melanocyte. That's not what it is. What it does is it directly injures the keratinocytes, which are much more abundant, sitting more superficially in the epidermis. And when that happens and the keratinocyte is damaged, this protein, P53, causes the cell to make a hormone called melanocyte-stimulating hormone that is secreted and it stimulates the melanocyte to make pigment, which is then exported back out and sits in the keratinocyte just like that. It turns out the receptor for melanocyte-stimulating hormone is the gene which, in redheaded people, is not functional. They have a variant form of that receptor that does not work when MSH is present. So they have a non-functional variant of this receptor called MC1. And that is the reason that redheads do not tan. Redheads have a perfectly normal response up to here, and then there's a wall. It cannot get the signal through. And in fact, that is so much the case that we wondered, could we artificially test this hypothesis by taking mice that are redhead and give them a drug topically that bypasses this receptor and stimulates the pigment pathway. This was actually kind of a scientific proof that we got the pathway right by rescuing it one step downstream. So all six of these mice are redheads, but every other one received that drug topically. And what you can see is that they actually rescue the pigment pathway, and it was protective against sunburning, mutations, and even UV-associated skin cancer. So this is sort of futuristically, <clears throat> perhaps a theoretical strategy that could be used as a different approach towards sun protection and, and particularly skin cancer protection because dark skin, dark skinned individuals have the lowest risk of not only skin cancer but also the lowest risk of photo aging, wrinkle formation, almost all of the toxicities of aging that we associate with UV, dark pigment is highly protective. So, last thing. <laughs> so tanning beds. Why do people go to tanning beds? Again, what sort of what are you smoking? I, I happen to love this ad. I, I, it's sad actually. I shouldn't. It's not funny um, that in 1949, you know, doctor, what cigarette do you smoke? Is there something where you're missing here? Because tanning beds, again, UV is well known. So here is this tanning response, and what we noticed several years ago is that when the keratinocyte makes MSH, there is a byproduct of that synthesis, which is a molecule called beta endorphin. And endorphin, you may have heard of, is one of the body's natural endogenous opiates. For every single molecule of MSH that produces pigment, endorphin is being synthesized as well. And so we wondered, could there actually be a opiate-related behavioral consequence of ultraviolet radiation on our skin? And so we tested this. And again, I apologize for the technical stuff that's going on here. But we had mice, and we gave them low doses of UV radiation, not, even, not sunburning, not even tanning doses, very, very low doses. And then all of a sudden, we gave them a drug called naloxone. Naloxone is the drug right here in the emergency department at MGH that you give a heroin overdose patient. It's an opiate blocker. And when we gave the opiate blocker to mice that had only received ultraviolet radiation, the red bars indicate opiate withdrawal. So every measure of what a mouse does when it has opiate withdrawal syndrome, shaking, tremors, etc., ultraviolet radiation was producing opiate dependency. But we hadn't given an opiate. We had just given UV. And so there's a lot of other data that I'm not showing you. We believed that it was the endorphin that was being synthesized in the skin that was making it into the bloodstream, that was making it into the brain, and was functioning exactly the same way. In fact, the natural way that our, our addiction centers are responding to an opiate. This is not an exogenous drug. It's the endogenous ligand for that receptor. And so we wondered, could this impact behavioral choice. So you can't ask a mouse, you know, do you feel good? Um, would you go to the beach on Sunday? 
But you can do something close to that. You can do a psychology experiment. And here's the, the psychology. This is one of the last things I'll show you. So what you do is you have two boxes. One is dark on the inside, and one is light on the inside. And they're connected by a little passageway. And you can open or close the passageway. I think this will close it. Yeah. Okay. So that's how you can, you can confine the mouse to one side or another side. So what we do is we have a whole bunch of mice which have received low-dose UV radiation, like 50 mice or something, a whole bunch of them. And we know that the UV has produced elevations in endorphin and that they ought to be addicted. That is to say, if we give them oxygen, they should have those withdrawal symptoms. But what we don't know is, would they care about them? You know, they're mice. I mean, <clears throat> you know, we see them shaking and tremors, but like, would that affect behavior? Like in humans, is sun-seeking behavior really a behavior, or is it just they want to look good from a ruddy tan? Is it and so we wanted to ask this question. So we have these mice, they all have elevated endorphin levels, and half the mice on Monday are put into the black box, and half of them are put into the white box. And in each box, half of the mice receive the drug naloxone to cause withdrawal symptoms, and they have to stay in that color box for one hour. And the other half of the mice receive a controlled saline like water, so nothing that wouldn't affect them. And so they have to stay in that color box while they're having the withdrawal symptoms for one hour on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And on Thursday, what we do is one by one, we open up these little doors and we let the mice choose which box they go in. But we don't give them naloxone, we don't give them UV, we don't, we don't do anything. We just ask, do they care about the color box that they're going in? And what we see is that if the mice receive naloxone, and only if they have received naloxone, they will switch box. If they were in black, they will now go to white, and if they were in white, they will go to black. But if the gene for endorphin had been knocked out, so we have genetically engineered mice that have no endorphin gene, they don't care, and they will distribute randomly. And so what this suggests to us is that we actually do have a pathway in our body that is organically encoded in our genomes through this endorphin gene that responds to ultraviolet radiation and is actually able to have a mouse choose where it's going to go. It's sort of like choosing on Sunday, would I rather go outside and avoid withdrawal symptoms? And that this is a form of UV-seeking behavior and that it's an organic process. So why would evolution select a carcinogen, ultraviolet radiation, for addiction? This does not seem logical. Right? UV is so dangerous. Well, here is the pathway. MSH would give you a tan. Endorphin would give you maybe something involving pain, but addiction, we believe, is vitamin D. Because 100,000 years ago, if you were vitamin D deficient, living in a cave in Scandinavia, you will die in childhood of rickets. You will not have bones, and you will not survive. If you get skin cancer, you probably will get it after you've had your children. The evolutionary selection is much, much weaker. And therefore, sun-seeking behavior, in addition to light skin, will guide you to want to get out of that cave for the 15 minutes of sunlight and potentially rescue your vitamin D. What it also means is that this conceivably was the first setting, and maybe the only setting, where addiction is actually a good thing. The behavioral consequence may actually be beneficial. And perhaps a lot of the opiate addiction that we're seeing today is a deleterious consequence of exogenous drugs that ultimately are imitating a UV pathway that we evolved in order to maintain vitamin D levels. You can also imagine that not only do we see melanoma and other skin cancers, but perhaps other psychiatric conditions like seasonal affective disorder, depression in the winter, might be related to a very, very similar pathway. And so, in closing, I want to emphasize education is important. Recognize UV radiation as addictive. Try to regulate teen and adult use, indoor tanning. There's reason to suspect this could be addictive. So tanning beds that offer, you know, five free treatments, and after that they start charging you. What a clever <laughs> business strategy for an addictive therapy. Skin screening. A very good way, certainly for individuals at risk, to catch cancer early. Melanomas early are cured most often. And use sun protection when participating 
outdoor activities, sunblock, hats, sunglasses, and protective clothing. And finally, teach your children that the natural pigment on everybody's skin is both beautiful and healthy. Thank you very much.